Hey y'all, my name is Andrew Jarding and welcome to my presentation on enabling a continuous deployment mindset. So in this talk, I'm going to discuss supporting a team that built the first continuous deployment pipeline in the federal sector, where we really focused on the culture and behavioral changes that enable us to reach this milestone. Okay, so let's jump into it. Just to get started, a quick introduction. So again, Andrew Jarding. I am the Director of Agile Transformation at Alpha Omega Integration, and we're a DC-based consultancy focused on providing disruptive solutions like RPA, DevOps, no-code, low-code development to the federal sector. I've spent 15 years of my career in consulting with the bulk of it really leading various Agile initiatives, so about the last 10 or so. And I typically focus on Agile Transformation, agility at scale, and providing coaching to leadership. And at the heart of any of these efforts is what I'm most passionate about, which is working with teams and organizations to improve their culture in order to drive higher and higher morale levels. So let's get started. I'll start with a little bit of background about this project, but just upfront, full disclosure, I can't mention the agency or product I was supporting, but I'm going to provide ample detail about the initiative to help set the stage going forward. All right, so to get started, I wanted to describe the team makeup. To begin, this was just a single cross-functional team and the effort intentionally started small so that we could pilot agility and DevOps practices to this organization that was new to it prior to eventually expanding to three teams supporting this single product a year later. In that first year, the team had me serving as a scrum master. We had a product owner, a designer, a handful of full stack engineers and a single DevOps engineer focused on cloud architecture and CI CD automation. And the main reason I want to start with team structure is to stress that this effort wasn't completed by a quote unquote DevOps team, which is actually becoming somewhat of a more prevalent anti pattern where a siloed set of cloud or CI CD engineers build out the infrastructure totally separate from the teams delivering features. And ultimately, this leads to handoffs and siloed knowledge. And that's really the, what the entire DevOps movement was seeking to avoid. Anyways, I'll get off my high horse. I just wanted to note that this type of thing can be completed by a single cross-functional team that has the collective skill sets across the group to deliver a feature from ideation all the way to deployment to production. It doesn't need to be a separate DevOps team. OK, so what was the scope of this project? We were tasked with modernizing an outdated legacy system for a federal client. And so again, while I can't get into the specifics, I can give an overview of what we were tasked with. So the legacy system in question involved a public facing enrollment system, along with a case management aspect for internal users of the government to resolve enrollments from that public facing group. And the system was pretty huge having around a million users that were generating about 30 million cases per year. From a technical perspective, everything was outdated. There was this monolithic application with an old tech stack and years of technical debt, which really was starting to make deployments pretty painful. And so we were taking over from this legacy team, but the legacy team that was managing the application at the time only did one deployment per quarter because it required taking down the entire application late on a Friday night, troubleshooting all weekend to get the release working correctly. And so they, they were trying to minimize the amount of pain they had to put themselves through due to the, the nature of this outdated application. So throughout this presentation, I want to jump into the mindset of the team. And the mindset at the start of this process could really just be summed up as intimidated. And why was that? The team was asking, how on earth are we going to tackle this huge thing? The system was huge and built over a decade, and we had no idea what we were going to modernize, how we were going to modernize everything. And then this user base was pretty intimidating as well. We were worried about introducing a bug to a million users or bringing down production for this highly vi visible federal system and maybe ending up in the Washington Post. So we kind of wanted to avoid that. And then there's the horror stories of the legacy team about deployments, which made us dread eventually going live with the modernized version. 
as we really didn't want to spend our nights and weekends troubleshooting releases. So all in all, the team was feeling a little worried at the start of this effort. So that's just a stage as far as what we were doing, we're modernizing this enormous old system and how we felt, which was intimidated by the task ahead of us. What we wanted to do was take a look at those primary questions and concerns from the team that were leading to intimidation in order to find solutions to mitigate that risk and, and help calm the team down. So let's take a look at each question one by one. First question, how will we tackle this huge system? Well, the first step is really to think small and identify a minimal viable product or more colloquially known as an MVP. And I know many are familiar with this lean startup concept, but just to ensure everyone is on the same page, an MVP is the earliest version of a product that allows for the maximum amount of learning by doing the least amount of work. Or in other words, what was the bare minimum number of features we could get out to test some of our business hypotheses around our client's goal for this modernization effort? So between the enrollment and case management sides of the applications, there was multiple different feature areas and user types we could focus on. And the question really was, well, what's that smallest area that we could begin to focus on to begin getting feedback from users on the modernization process? And we also wanted to think incrementally. So from there, we would also leverage the strangler pattern as far as our, our strategy for adding new features. So for those not familiar with the strangler pattern, it's a method used in modernization and big rewrite efforts where you gradually create a new system around the old one, eventually strangling off the entire old system. So to make this a little more tangible, what we would do is we would modernize a small piece of the, app, the application and sunset, sunset its legacy counterpart. And anytime there was a modernized feature, the user would redirect from the legacy side to the modernized side and, and, and back. And the strategy is that over time, you build more and more modernized features and sunset legacy ones until only the modernized application remains, which really helps prevent this huge risky cutover. And more importantly, you, you're able to realize your return on investment in modernization or a rewrite along the way and get feedback from users on how the modernization is going. So the next question was, what if we mess up things for those newly public users that are creating you know, 30 million cases a year? Or maybe let's switch this around. What can we do to mitigate that risk? So the easiest way was to assess the various users we had and look for user groups that would provide valuable feedback on our business goals while additionally being relatively low risk user groups. So we need to assess value and risk and anytime an Agilist has two variables to assess, they will probably bust out this handy dandy two by two matrix to help make a decision. So on the X axis at the bottom, we have risk mapped from low to high. And on the Y axis, we have value mapped from low to high. And from there, we could begin looking at the different user groups and mapping out where they might be relative to each other. So from a value perspective, we had two similar types of users that were completing a pretty similar task, really going through the, the basic enrollment process. But one was really risky over in the top right, as it really contained the vast majority of public facing users, really the bulk of this, this system. Conversely, in the top left, there was a smaller group of just a few thousand users doing a very similar enrollment process, but for a, a sort of a different area. And that came with a lot less risk if we happen to break something, because it would just affect you know, a few thousand as opposed to maybe up to a million. So we decided to move forward with that group because they maximized value while minimizing risk. And just for reference, this doesn't necessarily need to be focused on users. If you're, if you're thinking about you know, where to jump in on your own system of how to get started, it, it could be focused on you know, specific features or maybe individual work items or user stories. Really the main goal is how can we maximize value while minimizing risk? Then the last question related to that intimidation mindset was, well, are we going to be up all night deploying like the, the original contractors were? So for the initial release, it was unfortunately going to be somewhat of a big bang, or maybe at least a, a small bang where we were 
deploying the MVP to production all at once after about you know a three month period, and that would be our first production release. And we knew there was going to be unknowns for that initial release, but we knew we could also do our best to mitigate that risk along the way. And so this really won't be a, a groundbreaking or surprising step to people, but it really came down to automating as much as we could from the start with just basics like automated unit and acceptance tests. But we also knew that we couldn't automate every possible thing based on two factors. First factor was we had this initial deadline set by our client, you know, three months out, which required us to find the right balance between feature delivery and how much automation we could fit in from the start. Second, there is the fact that there was a lot of unknowns from an integration perspective because the system was integrating with other federal systems. And a lot of this was going to be discovered through manual testing as far as where the, the, the faults were. The last mitigating factor was that we had a defined production environment from our client that we would be using. So we had this, we had this known end state prescribed to us. So we made sure to have a staging environment that was identical to our future production environment. And with that identical environment, we were pretty confident that if we could test something successfully in staging, it would work appropriately in production. And if we could deploy it successfully to staging, we could deploy it successfully to production. In addition, this just allowed us to deploy incrementally to the staging environment along the way to prep for the eventual production deployment. So with this strategy, what we did was we created this safe to fail mindset. So the, the mindset of this team right now is this, this feeling of safety. And by safe to, feel, safe to fail mindset, I mean that people felt comfortable that even if they were to make a mistake, the risk was largely mitigated and that mistake would be most likely a non-issue. So this helped increase their confidence and reduce that intimidation factor. So when we were previously concerned about, well, how are we gonna modernize this giant thing? We had now focused on just a small piece of the application and could, could really focus in on making that as great as possible. When we originally worried about busting production for a million users or maybe bringing production down entirely, we have found this small low risk group of users that if there was issues, it wouldn't be the end of the world. And lastly, when we were worried about if our initial release would be this all night disaster, we built confidence through some early automation and that staging environment that was identical to production, where we were confident that everything that was working in staging should work pretty, pretty well in production. And this safe to fail mindset is one of the most key aspects to enabling a continuous deployment environment. People need to feel comfortable that even if they were to make a mistake, we've done our due diligence to mitigate risk and things in the end are more likely going to be okay. So how did that first release go? Well, simply put, it was pretty much a non-event. We had a few things to troubleshoot, but the release was done in just a few hours and we didn't spend the entire night and weekend getting the release live due to all the risk mitigation that we put in place. So we were pretty happy that you know we did our due diligence and we were able to get this out the door without any big issues. Okay, so the MVP is out. What is next? We thought it would be pretty easy because our client wanted to focus on measuring the success of the MVP against some of those modernization goals through some metrics and user feedback and use those to begin iterating on new features that we were pretty comfortable with how we would build. But there was kind of one big caveat. The client wanted us to begin deploying at least once a day. That was one of the big goals of this agency to sort of be at the forefront of the DevOps movement. So with this current goal, our current mindset shifted from safe to fail to, okay, now we're just really confused. The thoughts from the group involve, well, how do we even deploy more frequently? Most of us had really only been in environments where deployments were for some lengthy release that was always gonna be launched all at once. And then some people wondered if deploying was even their job or if that was really just relegated to our lone DevOps engineer or tech lead. But then really the main fear was, well, now we have actual users. So even though it's a smaller group, what happens if we break production for them? So this was a similar mentality to our initial intimidation 
of modernizing a giant system. When we think about this, this first question of, well, how do we even deploy more frequently? So what we had to do was adopt a similar approach to what we did with the MVP. What, what this has looked like from a deployment perspective though, so when compared to feature delivery. So instead of having this, this giant big goal where we tackle everything all at once and go from quarterly deployments to a daily deployment, we want to begin thinking of small goals again. So we want to think about how we could go from three month deployment to a month deployment and from a month deployment to deploying each two week sprint. And from there, how do we cut that in half to a week? And then how do we cut that to just deploying every single day? So breaking this down to smaller goals really helped make this more reachable for the team and alleviate, alleviated the concern around how we're actually going to get there. So then we had to adjust the mindset the deploying was only for a subset of people. And to be fair, I want to stress it's perfectly understandable and there was no blame here of why people had this impression, because the initial group who are involved in the deployment of the MVP were really just a small subset of our group. So it was the DevOps engineer, our tech lead, our product owner to sort of poke around in production and make, th make sure things were working. And then me kind of just creeping the corner, observing out of curiosity because I wanted to see how things went. So the major majority of the team hadn't actually been part of the initial deployment and had no real knowledge of it. So what we wanted to do was create a collective deployment mindset where the entire team was involved in the deployment process and there was this collective responsibility for how we deployed as opposed to just relegating it to a, a small group of people. So the solution was pretty simple. For the initial MVP, de MVP deployment and the, you know, the first one we did after that, we were just using Jenkins to manually kick off the latest successful build from staging into production. And then the tech lead and the product owner would sort of poke around and make sure everything was working. And there really wasn't any reason to silo that just to a subset of people. So what we started doing was we just got together to watch the DevOps engineer kick off the build, have the product owner run a smoke test and poke around in production. And then we collectively troubleshooted issues together as a team, instead of just, you know, leaving that to the tech lead to sort of figure out on their own. And after doing this for probably about a month, we realized, well, it's simple enough to do this, you know, once a month, why don't we just do it at the end of every sprint? So there, we just cut that goal from quarterly to once a month to once every two weeks, meaning that we were small, we were continually chipping away at those small goals and getting closer to our goal of deploying each day with a caveat that, yeah, this was all still pretty manual. One quick note on that manual smoke test, just in case people were curious. So when I discussed the strangler pattern, and how we were having users redirect between the legacy application and the modernized application, that was kind of the, the weak point in our testing and the application overall. And I'm not a technical person, so I can't really explain why that was, but it really was the root cause of most issues. So we just got in the habit of running through the application quickly in production, just to make sure everything truly was good to go after a deployment. So we wanted to continue to think smaller though. So we're at two weeks now. And each team member knew how to manually kick off Jenkins and run through a, a smoke test. So people began asking, well, why are we waiting until the end of the sprint to deploy all these stories at once? Can't we just do this every time a single user story is ready to deploy? And do we really need the whole team to sit around and watch? This is beginning to feel a little wasteful to some degree. So what we transitioned our process to was any time a story was moved to an accepted column on our Kanban board, meaning our product owner had completed an acceptance testing and agreed it was ready to deploy, it triggered this automated Slack bot to randomly tag any member on the team to kick off a deployment. And by any team member, I, I do mean any team member across all roles, whether it was an engineer or somebody less technical, myself included as the least technical person on the team. And then that team member, instead of the entire team, would run through kicking off things in Jenkins and completing a smoke test to make sure everything was good to go. But with people deploying on demand and 
more likely than not deploying things that they didn't even build since the Slack bot was just randomly tagging random people. It came back to this fear of, well, what if we break production again? And just like any previous time we were concerned, we worked to address the perceived risks so that we could reinforce a safe to fail environment. So to make sure people felt comfortable, we had experts available to always pair if anyone was you know, uncomfortable doing this alone. So the DevOps engineer could be there to help kick things off. The product owner could be there to help walk through the smoke test. The tech lead could be there to help troubleshoot any issues that were discovered. We also taught the team how to roll back to a previous build. So they knew that there was this contingency plan in case something actually did go out and break production. They didn't have to necessarily worry about finding an immediate fix. They could just roll back. And most importantly, what we did was we reinforced that, well, now that we're deploying just a single user story at a time, the risk carried with each deployment is really becoming negligible. So instead of all the inherent risks gathered with this large batch of, you know, maybe 20 user stories in a sprint, we were cutting that down to a minimal amount of risk with just one tiny user story, which was unlikely to cause issues. So what if things do break in production? I'd be lying if I said people could just follow this as a blueprint and everything was always going to work perfectly and you're never going to have a production issue. That, that'd be fully unrealistic. So things are going to go awry at some point, whether it's a minor defect escaping or potentially, you know, a huge outage. So the first thing that we need to do if this does happen is make sure that this, we reinforce that this isn't the fault of any individual. Instead, it's the fault of this broader system. And when I say system, I mean the collective group of people, processes, tools, and technology within our system of software development. So even if somebody made, you know, this simple mistake that you might have questioning, well, how on earth did this person even do this? It's still not the fault of the broader system. It's still the fault of the broader system for allowing that mistake to happen. And that leads to how we should treat, treat each production issue as blameless and think of it as this opportunity to learn and improve. So if something does get through because of the flaw in the broader system, where do we need to increase automation? Do we need to adapt our processes in some way? Do we actually just lack the skills to really safely get things out? We need to increase them either through hiring or training. So thinking of a production issue in this fashion can help reinforce that safe to fail mindset where people begin seeing these kind of issues as just further opportunities to improve as opposed to, you know, something to feel bad about if they do make a mistake. One really great way, just as a, a side note, to inspect any production issue in a blameless fashion is a timeline retrospective. <clears throat> so for those that aren't familiar, all you need to do is just create a rough timeline containing both before the production incident or, you know, everything that happened leading up to that. And then also include everything after that issue occurred or what did the team do to recover from that issue. And you can go through GitHub and Jenkins and Slack to get actual timestamps on, you know, all the steps that happened leading up to this and after and just map these out. And I'm always just a fan of whiteboard and sticky notes or, you know, virtual role easily done in, in tools like Miro or Mural. And from here, you have this detailed view of everything that happened, both leading up to the production incident and what the team did to resolve the incident. So this can drive conversations around what steps can we take to improve the safety of each deployment? In addition to, you know, what steps might be needed to increase our monitoring abilities in a, the event that, you know, this was an issue that we just didn't respond to fast enough. So fast forward, we've been doing this for about a month or so. Where is the mindset now? Well, the team had mastered manually deploying, but we were now getting pretty frustrated. So first off, why were we frustrated? Well, this was getting pretty disruptive. Somebody was heads down working on a feature and all of a sudden they get tagged in Slack to deploy and run a smoke test, monitor the pipeline. And this was creating some painful context switching. Second, this manual smoke test was getting super annoying because uh, each person any given week was running through the entire application just multiple times making sure everything was working fine. And lastly, there is this upcoming concern about well, how was this actually going to scale? Because we had plans to begin expanding to up to three teams, 
We're going to be working on tons of microservices at the same time. So what is this going to look like when all of a sudden everyone's getting tagged across all these three teams for all these different microservices? That was just going to exacerbate things. So I could sense that the team was frustrated, but it was important that I made those frustrations transparent to the entire team. And there's a number of ways you can go about making those transparent. Retrospectives are really the most obvious example um, as the whole team is present, so everything can, everyone can hear everything at once. But you know, other options are you know, surveys or having one-on-ones across the team where you can then anonymize and aggregate the data and share it with everyone so everyone understands the collective sentiment of their team. And that's really just the first step. Making these pain points transparent allows you to then inspect the problem further and determine how to adapt and continuously improve going forward. So reaching continuous deployment. Well, this, this did not happen overnight by any means, but it was really through the continuous discussion of pain points and making those transparent that we began running, running some experiments to see how we could alleviate those pain points. So the first experiment we ran was playing around with feature toggles. And we began putting each user story behind a feature toggle to further increase the safety of each team member. So we're even if a new user story deployed could break something, it could just be toggled off and allow us to fix it and put out a fix as opposed to just you know constantly going back to rolling back from the previous build. Second, we automated that annoying smoke test so that the build wouldn't even reach production if the smoke test failed. And with those two pieces in place, we really felt safe that we had all the correct checks in place. And we automated that final step of the, the Jenkins build to production. So then we began deploying uh, not just once a day, but we were deploying multiple times a day with every commit. And our team had adopt, adopted this continuous mindset through this sense of safety, but there was still one thing we forgot. And that is we forgot the customer, so, so don't do that. We had, we had made this journey as a team, but we really forgot to bring them along with us. So let's think about the customer mindset. In one word, they were basically annoyed. And why was that? Well, the main gripe we began hearing from our end users was, why do things keep changing? So one thing to keep in mind is that this was a huge federal system that over the course of a decade had really undergone minimal changes. And now we are just deploying things all the time and flipping new features on willy nilly. And the user base wasn't used to this kind of change. And what we had was two different types of users, as you remember. So we had our internal case management users uh, as you know uh, federal employees, and then our public facing users that were using it to enroll in the system. So for our internal users, we had complaints about they hadn't received training at all. So how are they? they supposed to actually work cases if the workflow might be changing on the fly. And our public users were pretty upset because they hadn't received any heads up at all. They had mostly become pretty efficient at using this legacy system, especially the power users, where they could just you know, sort of tab through things and get through the application pretty quickly. But all of a sudden, you know, new fields might be required, some fields might disappear, some documentation might be required. And they didn't, they weren't fully aware of the changing scenery of how they were supposed to complete their enrollment process. So just as we did with our team, it was important to make these issues transparent and work with our end users on a solution. So where did we land to bring our customers along the way on this journey with us? Well, first we realized we need to make sure there is ample training for our internal users and ample outreach to our public users before we turn on new features. So we had feature toggles in place. Uh, what we did was our product owner made sure to provide details to stakeholders representing either of those groups. And those stakeholders would come up with adequate training and outreach plans, and they would let us know when it was safe to feature on, to turn on a feature based on uh, having the end users actually understand what was gonna happen. But given that lead time between deploying a feature and completing outreach, we were creating this feedback loop that was much longer than we desired. 
uh, as you know, sometimes it could be up to a month before we had talk, we had actually received the go ahead to toggle fe a feature on, and we, we really wanted to be able to get feedback a lot quicker than that. So we began inviting some key representatives from user groups to product demos so that even if a feature wasn't toggled on, we could get feedback more frequently and improve that feedback loop. And just a quick side note here, I know uh, sprint reviews are nothing groundbreaking, but I do find, you know, as we did here, oftentimes you're inviting stakeholders who represent users as opposed to inviting actual users who can provide, you know, a lot more valuable feedback since they're in the system all day. So that was really the key difference I wanted to call out here. And to further improve that feedback loop, we began Canary deployments to a group of power users who were pretty comfortable and also excited about frequent change. And they didn't necessarily require outreach. So we were able to get super fast feedback from them because once a feature was deployed, it was available for these power users to use and let us know how they liked it or, or didn't like it. One thing is here, the, I mean, these solutions aren't necessarily, you know, the blueprint for every team and you might not leverage, you might leverage some or might leverage all of them, maybe none of them. But really the key aspect I want to drive point here is that these were the solutions that made our users happier based on the discussions that we had with them and it removed that annoyance that was previously being voiced. What we had to do was understand their appetite for change and how frequently it was, as well as, you know, as you can see here, there's, it was somewhat segmented as, as far as what some people wanted from a change perspective. And that's the entire journey. So let's share some quick takeaways as we wrap up. So first off, think about small and incremental goals. We didn't go from quarterly releases to continuous deployment overnight, nor did we, you know, just set aside months of time to build out an automated pipeline before we got started. We set small goals going from a quarterly release to a monthly release to sprint to each week to daily to continuously where we chipped away at these small goals to improve over time. And if you're just getting started in this, uh, think about ways that you could minimize risk. So as we did, we thought through specific user groups, but similarly, you can think about specific features that might be good ones to uh, maximize value, but also minimize risk as you move that specific area of features to continuous deployment. Also really think about how you can elicit elicit feedback and listen to the concerns of your team to understand what their mindset is. And that's kind of been the focus of this, constantly digging into the mindset along the way and use this information to create a safe to fail environment. Listen to your team, listen to their concerns, figure out ways to turn those concerns into productive solutions where you mitigate the risk that was associated with them. And along the same lines, when, when issues do occur, because they're going to, Reinforce safety by thinking of this as a broader systemic issue and not a personal one. And reinforce that this is really just an opportunity to learn every time we do make a quote unquote mistake, that was the system's fault and we need to improve the system as a whole. Also think about ways to make deployment a team-wide responsibility as opposed to just you know a subset of people. So remember, we went from just this small group involved in deploying to engaging the entire team including non-technical people like myself, where everyone was responsible for the overall de a successful deployment of our product. Additionally, make sure that teams are aware of recurring pain points and make these transparent, whether you know it's through retros or surveys, so that the team with that transparency can analyze those pain points and create experiments to further automation. And lastly, don't forget the customer, bring them along on this journey. Getting to continuous deployment isn't really the promised land if you've done nothing but annoy your users like we originally did. So collaborate with them, listen to them, figure out their appetite for change and find solutions that will satiate how much change they either want or don't want to find the right balance. So again, that was enabling a continuous deployment mindset. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it.